Welcome to season two of All Go If You Go, a Save the Redwoods League podcast. We're building community and illuminating how Californians from all walks of life think about and experience nature and conservation in the Redwoods and beyond. I'll go if you go, because when we explore together in community, the experience is all the more powerful. Hello world, here we are at episode three. I'd like us all to begin by taking a deep breath and letting it out. It's March 2022, and I think we can all agree that times are tough right now. I hope you're all taking good care and that you and your loved ones are safe and well. Right now, I think many of us are looking for the warmth of community, a sense of peace, and some beauty in our lives. Spring has officially sprung here in the Northern Hemisphere, which means lots of things. Sunnier days, blooming flowers, baby animals, and birds. Right around now, migratory birds who flew south for the winter are coming back north to roost. That means that now is a great time to see not just the birds themselves, but the super cool nests they build and, my favorite, fluffy little nestlings, and the wet scraggly ones too. Which brings me to today's featured activity, birding. When you picture a birder, who do you see? There is a right answer, and I'll give you a hint. First, imagine a bird you've seen or heard recently. Now, if you can, go find a mirror. The answer is, it's you. On today's episode, here to tell us all about birding is Clay Anderson. Clay is a birder, naturalist, environmental educator, illustrator, and artist. A former leader of Outdoor Afro, Clay currently leads youth programs for Golden Gate Audubon Society, teaching kids about environmental stewardship and how the natural world works. And he runs seasonal bird counts and nature journaling classes. Those are for adults too. Plus, Clay also has some exciting art projects going on, which we'll get to hear about later in the episode. Okay, time to get going and head over to Oakland, where I met up with Clay to ask him, what even is birding? Uh, so birding is a, is a uh, process of delineation. You're just kind of basically, um, you know, looking at things really closely and learning their habits. These organisms, you're learning their habits and what they are, what they do, and also the interactions, which is really what I like to see, how things are interrelated. And so these animals are, in a way, are kind of indicative of what's going on in the environment. And if we've got animals that are doing what they naturally normally do, then you've got, you, you know you've got the right kind of environment. Your environment is healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And where are we and what are we looking at? So we're sitting at Lake Merritt between, right next to the Rotary Nature Center. Um, it is, uh, Lake Merritt is actually, technically the entire lake is the oldest wildlife refuge in the United States. And most people don't know that it was founded in 1870. It's the oldest recognized wildlife refuge in the U.S. Um, and it's actually uh, cared for or managed right now by the city of Oakland. So That's so cool. Yeah. Right in the middle of Oakland. Right in the middle of Oakland, yeah. Wow. So it's a great... Um, it's a great opportunity and an intersection for people and wildlife. And most people don't even realize how lucky they are to have a refuge right in the center of a high urban area like this. Of course, it's one of my favorites because it does have a lot of birds, um, but we have a lot of uh, the uh, birds you would find normally in the San Francisco Bay. And it is also part of the West, West Coast Flyway. So we get a lot of birds from up in Alaska and the Arctic that come down and spend the winter here and overwinter here and then they go back. But um, there's also a plenty of residents and uh, they're all very interesting, a lot of endemics. Uh, birds that are shorebirds and water birds, and there is a difference. <laughs> um, and so it's a really cool spot. And we also have uh, breeding birds here, uh, like I say, residents. Um, and we also get some of the oceanic birds too, so it's really nice. I started birding when I was a little kid, when I was sitting in my backyard. <laughs> we'll let him steal the show for a minute. Um, when I was a little kid and um, just kind of watching the overall, you usually overfed our dog. And so um, 
the ball, the food would sit in the bowl, and here would come all these little house sparrows, and they would come and mob the bowl and eat the food and stuff. And you just, I was just sitting there watching them, and I realized, I started recognizing a pattern. And two birds would be in the bowl, only two, while all the birds, the other birds were crowded around. And those two birds would jump on the rim of the bowl and then fly away with their food. And another pair would jump in, get food and so on and so forth. And so there was an organization there, kind of a social structure. So I realized, oh, there's more to this than just mobbing and, and wild animals. There's something going on here. So I, that's when I started getting into birding. And that was like, I don't know, eight or nine years old. And where was this? This was in my backyard in Chicago, Illinois. I'm originally from Chicago. Um, and I've been out on the West Coast for about 40 years now. Mm -hmm. What do you need to do birding? Like, do you need special gear? Do you need to study up before you get out there and start looking at them? Yeah, no, it's a totally entry-level sport, if you want to call it that. Um, some people would just call it an activity, um, but depends on how far you want to take it. The sky's the limit. Um, but yeah, all you need is your curiosity, uh, desire to learn, and there's tons of information out there already for people to, to get on the internet, books, et cetera. Um, and and if, you get, if you're lucky enough to get a pair of binoculars, which is pretty easy at about a hundred bucks, uh, that'll get you really, that'll start to pull you in. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to get into birds and anybody can do it. Do you have any recommendations for like a, a nice field guide? people can take out with them? Oh or? God, yeah, there's tons of that stuff. I mean, I I follow both digital and paper. Um, oh wow, right there. The song, that? little song sparrow. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the, the, the Sibley Guide is the hottest thing out right now, but National Geographic does a great job. Um, uh, Peterson Guide is still out there and they all have different approaches. So even if you got all three of them, be great. Um, Merlin, uh, Merlin, the Merlin app you can get, and uh, All About Birds is a fantastic oh, yeah. resource. Uh, there's just so much stuff out there uh, that you can get into. Just download one of the apps and get some of the bird sounds. Um, I'm a bird by, I bird by ear a lot, so uh, you can get to that level if, you, if you're into music more than visual, then you can get into birding that way. Um, so, but there's tons of information out there and there's tons more to learn. So it's just, it's not, that's what's so fun about it is, you know, you could be Joe Schmo and learn something new to contribute to the science or continue to do the study. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very open discipline and uh, you can take it all the way up to Cornell and take classes at Cornell if you want. And um, just go travel the world and see some of these amazing birds that, that live on our planet, share this planet with us. Um, it's just never-ending amazement. <laughs> <laughs> like a real-life Pokemon trainer. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I never did Pokemon, but yeah, something. It's it's like, you know, you don't get to train them, but you get to learn how they're using the environment. And then this is how we've learned how to use the environments a lot through these earth cultures uh, of 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 what these birds are doing or what this animal is doing, and then and then copying that. And that was that's essential to human survival. So we have a lot to thank them for. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that birding isn't all that you do. So what else is in the picture of Clay Anderson? <laughs> well, I, I got formally trained in, in arts, in the arts, not just by the school, but by my mother. My mother was an illustrator for uh, one of the oldest black newspapers in the United States, and that's the Chicago Defender. And so she kind of passed that on to some of us in my family. And um, I just really dug illustrating and drawing and stuff. So illustrating was one of my favorites. Um, but I also like doing art, just, you know, open creative art for myself. Um, and I try to incorporate that as much as I can in my, in my, in my work. Um, and of course, as a naturalist, again, we're talking about um, systems, our natural systems. and how we as, as a species can um, encourage these systems and pr protect and preserve these systems because they're the key to our survival, not just to the wildlife, you know? So um, you can't just study birds and not be concerned about the rest of it, right? So 
I was always into all of it anyway, so it was, it was easy for me. But um, yeah. Did you ever try to formally study birds or any kind of environmental science? Yeah, I went to school for a few years uh, for environmental studies up in uh, Wisconsin. A place called a little top school called Northland College. I don't even know if they exist anymore. Uh, but I went there for a few years and realized I wasn't prepared for college. And um, I thought, well, let me figure something else out. And I moved out, moved out to California to be with my father. My father lived here at the time. And, um, and I went to start going to school at uh, San Jose State. And I got my degree in art, drawing, and painting at that point. But I always took, I was always keeping my finger in natural history and natural science. I was always into that. Um, I should have made minored in it, but. Anyway, I got out of school. My first job out of college was, a, of course, an environmental education program. So it was great. I loved it. And I worked with environmental groups for, you know, off and on for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the pay isn't that, at that time wasn't that great. It still isn't that great. Um, and um, so sometimes I'd have to get out to get money and do other things. And then eventually it would draw me back in, you know? So, yeah. yeah. So when you say you worked with environmental groups, you mean like with, with kids or with adults? Or yeah, with I worked for, uh, of all things, I mean, you told me what Save the Red was, like, I'm very familiar with them because I used to work at Big Basin State Park. And I worked there for almost five or six seasons while I was going to college uh, at San Jose State. Um, so anyway, um, I would go over there during the summer and work as a park aide and um, eventually I would be there for nine months out of the year because they gave us housing and and I was thinking about becoming a ranger but um, that dream faded when you can see most rangers at that time and I don't know about now but they were mostly glorified policemen you know worrying about defensive tactics and shooting and sneaking around checking on people and it was just like no nah, I don't want to do that yeah. so um, yeah so that dream faded and I just stayed as kind of a naturalist person and I would do all the naturalist things that these glorified policemen didn't want to do because they would they would have a detail one of their part of their job was to do nature interpretation they weren't doing that so they were like hey could you do it and I was like hmm, let me think about that sure <laughs> <laughs> so I kept doing that and just you know getting more experience and worked with um, uh, some of the guys that built the museum there um, helping them learn, learning about, a little bit about taxidermy and present and exhibits. Um, and I built the sign, I, I painted, created the sign for them, for that museum, which they used for almost 35 years. Wow. Yeah, I went back like a few years ago and there it was. I was just like, wow. So I got some pictures of it and then I went back the next year and got some more pictures of it. I was just like, okay, great. And then the, then the fire happened. But, but you're uh, a real part of Big Basin history. Then. Yeah, I was there for quite a few years and had a great great time. I mean, you know, when you got, I think it's like 20,000 acres of, of wilderness as your backyard. It's just like, I can walk off into the woods just like right out of my back door. And it was amazing. I had some great times hunting mushrooms and uh, learning, uh, working with uh, some of the biologists that come in there to do research, particularly on the marble murlet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is one of the birds you find in the red. It was totally, well, not totally, but heavily connected to the redwood forest, old redwood forest, right? So, right. They spend uh, part of their life out at sea and then come back to the old growth redwoods to nest. Yes. So we would get out at three, four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> couldn't see, and went count, count these birds flying back from the ocean. Uh, caring and it was pretty cool. Um, what are some other birds people can see or hear in the redwood forest? You know, the spotted owl is another one that's kind of connected to the redwood forest. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones like Pacific Wren and there's some pretty um, endemic birds. Uh, Paleated woodpeckers are heavily connected to a redwood forest only because the what's left of the redwood forest is protected and so uh, these birds need large trees. And so they kind of hang out in those areas, but they're also they're also going to Douglas Fir and mm -hmm. other places, you know. But uh, if you wanted to see one in the Bay Area, one of the best places to go to see one is one of the redwood parks, like Muir or Basin or something.
I was really excited to ask Clay about the popular nature journaling classes he leads at Lake Merritt. To be a naturalist or an artist requires paying attention to the world around you and how you respond to it. Nature journaling is one of the ways you can do that. It's the practice of recording your observations, thoughts, questions, and feelings in response to nature, whether that's through writing or drawing. It can be an observation about your surroundings or how you're feeling in response to something in your environment. In short, it's a great way to bring your attention to where you're at. It's year round, so and it's open enrollment, so if people want to jump in and pay for six months, they can. If they want to do the whole year, they can. We break in July, come back in September, and start the whole cycle again. So people can journal and witness what's going on in the lake through the seasons. And we share in our, cl in our group. Uh, there's no, you know, grades or anything. It's just people and their experiences and sharing their experience with about the lake. So, um, and you can, you can be a writer, you can be an artist, you can be both, or you can be neither. It doesn't matter. It's totally open to everyone who wants to learn. Um, and we do uh, every once a month for 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 uh, ten months. We meet uh, second Thursday of every month, and then that following Saturday we meet out here on the lake for a nature walk. So and maybe journal while they're out. We're out here. That seems yeah. like a really fun way to get a sense of place and feel a connection. To yes, you. exactly. That's the whole point: is to get people familiar with the lake and the refuge and. Um, and appreciate it, you know, develop some more appreciation for it because, you know, with all the activity that goes on in a, in a high urban area like this, it's easy to neglect a refuge when people are looking for refuge themselves. Mm -hmm. But if you turn into the refuge, you can get some healing here, and especially if you take care of it and add to it. Anything about your work, your birding, your art, your environmental education that you want people to know about? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, hopefully I'll be publishing some books in the future. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> some some art books, of course. Always looking for opportunities to talk with folks about nature and the issues around nature and, and you know, conservation, wildlife conservation, and just uh, maybe one day running a nature center. That's one of my dreams. Ah, I want to visit your nature yeah, center. Yeah, it it's one of those long-term goals of, of mine. So, yeah, I mean, I'm always being approached by folks to talk about stuff. It's, it's fun. I really enjoy it. As we come to the close of this interview, we'd like to end with a lightning round of just fun questions, popcorn style. Okay. So just feel free to answer with whatever whatever comes to mind. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the first one. Can you give us a bird call? <laughs> um, let's see, something easy. <laughs> I'm not very song singy. I've never been very singy, but I go, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> that is uh, a heron. That's as, that's as melodious as they get. So. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> okay, next question. If your personality was embodied by a bird, what bird would it be? Well, that depends. Strength and power and determination, I would say golden eagle. Intelligence, I would say stellar jay or something like that. Reaching for reaching long term, I would say a uh, probably a tern, you know, Caspian tern, Turacos. Turacos are amazing to me in terms of form. I just, I just love that bird. And it's from Africa, actually. It's not from here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> there you go, some research. What's your favorite bird right now? Not your all-time favorite, but just a bird you've been seeing recently that you've really been enjoying spending time with. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Well, I've been doing a little bit of getting my teachers some information on some birds, and I really got into the house finch, hmm. which most people don't even think about very much. It's a nondescript bird, not very showy. The males have a little bit of red on their head, but one of the remarkable things about them is that they've, in a span of like 30 or I think 40 or 50 years, their, their population has spread across the United States. They were only in the deserts before Western man came into the situation. And then once we started doing feeders and having houses built all over the place, 
the bird just expanded because it's not afraid of people. It actually sees kind of people as kind of an opportunity. So we, of course, we named it the house finch because it will come to your house and use your house as a nesting space. So it's a very uh, intelligent animal in that way. And so I find that fascinating that this bird actually expanded its range because of human influence and not reduced, which yeah. is mostly usually the case. Yeah, so. That's really cool that they came from the deserts. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. What is your favorite non-bird animal right now? God, Lord, you're gonna give me harder and harder. <laughs> I can't just do these. Okay, I'll just say numbat. Ooh. And numbats are, <laughs> numbats are an anteater that lives in Australia. And uh, they're living, they live in southwest Australia. They're a marsupial equivalent of an anteater. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Can you name an artist who inspires you? Well, one of the, one that most people are familiar with is somebody like Van Gogh. It was amazing because of the textures that he created in his work. Um, I really dug, dig that artist, but there's, t oh my God, there's tons of artists that I just love. But yeah, that's one it's easy to easy to recognize for folks. Are there any local Oakland artists you've been getting into? Eddie Gale is a great illustrator. And he's, I think he, I don't know if he's passed or not, but he, he made some beautiful illustrators. And I wanted, that's one of the few artists I was like, I want to be like him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's an African-American illustrator. And do you have a favorite medium to practice art in? No, I try to create it however I see it. So um, I tend to fall into pencils a lot. But I also dig, I work in watercolor or you know, oils, whatever, you know, to, to, to create what it is I see in my head, you know, that's because I like to work from my, my mind when I do art. So, but yeah, I didn't, pencils because, um, because it lends itself to illustration. Yeah, but, but anything that, that makes, that, that's going to get me to achieve my goal to where I'm trying to go to, so. Do you have a favorite Redwood Park? Of course, you did obvious big basin. That's where I got sprung on redwoods, you know. I, yeah, when, like I say, when I used to, the rangers would say, Clay, could you do that camp, that nature walk for me? Of course, you know. And so I'd go and talk about redwoods, go research them and talk about them, and you get to see them and what was happening. And uh, I think mean, one time we were in the office and one of the trees fell. Oh my God, it was like it was like a bomb went off. So you heard a tree fall in the forest? Yeah, it shook. And that was about half mile away yeah it shook our it shook the floor of the hot building it was amazing yeah wow. yeah those big those big trees fall man that sounds like one of those truly awe-inspiring moments out in, yeah. in nature yeah i mean after we got over the shock realized <laughs> we were still alive and we all ran over there and it was just like marveling when they fall they lay on the ground for you know 500 600 years and, yeah. and contributing back to the forest all those years, you know. Right. Yeah, it, it's a, it's, it was a super cool experience. I learned a lot um, just being there, you know. And last question, what place feels like home? What place feels like home? Wherever I am. <laughs> <laughs> but out in nature, of course, you know. Any kind of a nature space is, is where I want to be. And, uh, coming to Lake Merritt, you know, puts me back there, you know, as noisy as it is. <laughs> it's, it's here for the birds. It's here for the wildlife. And that's, that's, uh, that tells me that, you know, every time I go to a wildlife, when I travel, I go to wildlife refuges. I go to, I go to uh, some of the uh, uh, Indian reservations because I'm part of that. So um, I get to see it, it reaffirms, you know, humanity for me. Because we're, we're basically all this stuff. Our bodies are basically all this stuff. So here for the birds, here for the wildlife, can, yes. including the people too. Yes, indeed. Indeed. You can't do it without people. <laughs> Definitely can't do it without people. So thank you for the interview. This is great. Explore Redwoods is your portal into California's magical coast, Redwood and Giant Sequoia Forests. Visit ExploreRedwoods.org to learn what's available in more than 100 Redwood parks and plan an unforgettable adventure. From hiking and biking trails to camping to swimming holes, this web-based app will get you there. Visit ExploreRedwoods.org.